Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm David Weber. I'm the Associate Dean for Intellectual Life at Boston University School of Law, where I also serve as a professor. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome all of you today on behalf of the law school and also on behalf of our two partners for today's panel. First, the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism, a partnership between private, public, and civic sector leaders on initiatives to make capitalism inclusive and its benefits more widely and equitably shared. Hopefully, when you registered for today's panel, you also saw the link to the coalition's Framework for Inclusive Capitalism, a new compact among business, government, and American workers, which I'll also add as a link in the chat and which is an inspiration for our being here today. Our second partner is the Review of Banking and Financial Law, a student-run journal here at BU and the country's oldest and one of its most distinguished scholarly banking and financial law journals. Thank you both for your partnership. It's no secret that in recent decades, American workers have lost far too much ground. Too much of the gains of economic growth have gone to a tiny sliver of society while worker economic welfare has stagnated and declined. Unrelenting legal and business attack on unions, declining unionization, increased competition and automation, declining worker voice inside the companies where they earn their living, often in favor of distant shareholders, has dashed the American dream for millions of people. Rates of economic inequality not seen since the 1920s are not only unjust, but now increasingly appear to be threatening our democracy. Much as we are aware of this structural silencing and suppression of worker economic voice, we are also aware of the fact that we are living in the era of Black Lives Matter. Millions of people in this country have been doubly excluded from American economic life, not just because they are workers, but because of racism and sexism and other forms of discrimination. In today's panel, we're gonna examine these two intimately interconnected topics together to ask what, what role some of society's most powerful institutions, institutional investors, can do to fight the decline of the American worker, to amplify the voice of the American worker in the economy, to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to promote racial justice. These conversations are vital, and I cannot imagine assembling a panel of experts that is more qualified to discuss them in the investment context and more broadly, and that can truly report on these issues from the front lines. So I'm happy to begin by introducing our panelists in alphabetical order. Shea Bucknor is the head of the $10 billion North America Division of Newton Investment Management, a London-based global investment management subsidiary of BNY Mellon. He was promoted to the job a few months after joining the company as a commercial investment director, in which role he was responsible for promoting the firm's integrated and sustainable investing credentials in both institutional and intermediary, intermediary markets in the US. And let me say in my view that both Shea himself and Newton in general among private institutions have been really um, uh, at the head of the field in terms of thinking about um, empowering workers and diversity and in investment. Deborah Goldberg is the treasurer of the state of Massachusetts. In that capacity, she chairs the Pension Reserves Investment Management Board which oversees the nearly $90 billion in assets under management in the form of Massachusetts and worker retirement funds. In 2015, she established the new Office of Economic Empowerment, the first of its kind in the country. She chairs its Economic Empowerment Trust Fund. She was also elected to serve as president of the National Association of State Treasurers. She's president emeritus of Adoptions with Love and serves on the advisory board of the Greater Boston Food Bank. And in my view, Deb, as we're going to hear, has also been at the cutting edge of thinking how to deploy workers' capital to advance the interests of workers as workers and also on the, in advancing the cause of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thea Lee is the president of the Economic Policy Institute, where she advocates for working families. She came to EPI from the AFL-CIO, where she served as Deputy Chief of Staff. She has spent her career advocating on behalf of working families in national policy debates on issues like wage inequality, workers' rights, and fair trade. She's the co-author of the Field Guide to the Global Economy, 
has authored numerous publications on NAFTA, uh, international trade, the domestic steel and textile industries. Uh, uh, Thea, thank you so much for joining us today. Renee Manley is a deputy director at the Service Employees International Union in the Department of Strategic Initiatives, where she works with pension trustees in the public and private sector to integrate best practices on investments in corporate governance. The SEIU, its planned participants in both public pension funds and Taft Hartleys amount to over a trillion dollars in collective retirement assets. Renee leads her team's efforts on diversity and inclusion with a specific focus on financial services. And we're gonna be hearing directly from her today about some of the most exciting developments in this space, namely shareholder proposals that she has filed that we're gonna be hearing about shortly. Renee, thank you for joining us. Dan Pedrotti directs capital strategies at North America's Building Trades Union. The capital strategies program was created in 2016 to facilitate a more active partnership between the unions and the trustees who oversee their pension savings. Dan uh, formerly read, led the AFL-CIO's Office of Investment as well as the one for the American Federation of Teachers and has also been active in promoting responsible contractor policies that we'll be hearing about today. Last and certainly not least, Leo E. Strine Jr. is of counsel in the corporate department at Wachtell Lipton, Rosen and Katz, and he is the former Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court, where he served from 2014 to 2019. Before becoming the Chief, he served on the Delaware Court of Chancery since 2011 and as Vice Chancellor since 98. His judicial opinions, many of which our own students have read, have covered areas of corporate law, contract law, trusts and estates, and, and so on and so forth. And in the last decade, I think he's been the leading business law judge in this country and has rapidly turned himself into one of the leading business law intellectuals in this space. We're honored and delighted to have all of you with us here today. Thank you so much. Quick logistics point, please ask questions and use the Q&A button below to ask your questions. At a minimum, we'll be reserving 30 minutes of time at the end of the 90 minute session for Q&A. And if I can, I'd like to try and work your questions in as we go along. But first, I want to give everybody a sense of what these outstanding leaders are up to. So let me turn first to Deb Goldberg. Deb, you uh, and uh, in this, your capacity as treasurer, you have helped oversee a revision of Massachusetts's proxy voting guidelines. Can you tell us a little bit about those recent revisions? What were they? Why now? Uh, and what are the objectives of that? So when you first posed that question to me last week when we chatted, I said to you, well, you sort of have to step back and see it in the broad view of what I brought into the office in 2014. Because I have a belief, and I say this to everyone, that what you preach to others, you must start at home. And so I came into the office um, and it was, part of the motivation of creating the Office of Economic Empowerment, but I came in with the understanding that very consistently since the 1980s, um, that was the real beginning with the junk bond craze and the takeover of a lot of companies that were good employers, uh, of beginning to create this vast um, income and wealth gap that we now see today. And I understood how this disproportionately has impacted workers and people from all types of diverse backgrounds. And yet, while we've made gains in some areas, they don't result in economic stability and economic su success. So that is the vision and the passion that I brought into this office. I didn't just want to do functional parts of it where you do cash management and debt management. Mm -hmm. Prior to running, I looked at it as a vehicle to institute policy change. And policy change that wasn't necessarily political because I have a belief that economic stability and economic opportunity is good for everyone. It's not a blue dream or a red dream, but in order for that to be successful, it has to include everyone, or we end up with such gaps that society becomes totally disrupted. 
And we can yes. clearly see that in, in the proxy guidelines that, that you have overseen the revisions of. Let me put a couple of the facts in, in, into the mix here. What you oversaw was now you, Massachusetts PRIM, Pension Reserves Investment Management Board, which you oversee, is going to vote against or withhold votes from nominees at companies you're invested in if the board is less than 35% diverse, either in terms of race or in terms of gender. And also another really noteworthy thing here. Wait a minute, David. Yes. 35% in terms of race and another 35% in terms of gender. Yes, not combined, you separate. Not combined. Right, right. Whereas to when we started, when I got there in 2015, the board voted against boards that had either one woman or one person of color. That's right. So you've, you've, you've stepped up the pressure, clearly. And on top of that, I also just want to note that you're supporting shareholder proposals requiring companies to guarantee health insurance coverage, hazard pay, and overtime pay for essential workers during the pandemic, right? This is not the kind of thing making sure workers get paid that historically institutional investors have been known for, right? But this is, so this is, you view this as operationalizing sort of the philosophy that you brought into office. Is that, is that a fair way to put it? Yes, and we started at home and consequently we have the most diverse workforce in state government by a long shot. We have wage equality. We have um, paid parental leave since I got there. We have all sorts of things that other people have not done because we feel we can show that we're successful from a business aspect while simultaneously being able to promote with a clear conscience that we do all these things at home. And I think that's a, a critical argument. Plus I came from a business background. So I came from a, from a business background where we early on instituted many different things that are similar to what the proxy voting guidelines today demand and we were financially successful. So the business argument goes further back than the latest studies done by, uh, by State Street or by Pew, which shows that instituting these kind of policies do make people financially more successful. So let me ask you something before I turn to Dan, which is, um, what did you did you get any kind of pushback? Did you well, get any kind of, <laughs> let, let was, what was the resistance points? Well, initially, um, when I first started doing this, I had unanimous votes in support of, uh, of the actions that we were taking. However, um, with some changes in the makeup of the board, uh, we began to find that there were some people who had a narrow vision, a much narrower vision of what fiduciary duty means. And I have a very broad view of what fiduciary meeting, uh, fiduciary duty means. And I believe that fiduciary duty is what your, uh, your beneficiaries would want, both in terms of a stable retirement, but also what they care about. And so uh, in this last um, round, and it's been going on for a couple of years because um, as we came out with a position on, on non-disclosure agreements that became controversial, uh, anything that deals with women or people from diverse backgrounds or what is traditionally um, seen that should be a business's imperative, we've now begun to have some questioning and conflict about. But, you know, I come out of local politics and I know how to count votes. And so my feeling is um, keep on pushing through and making sure you have the votes to be able to win these, these discussions and they are actual votes. And well, so I'm I also, think running I'm for speaking. town meeting and selectmen I think was very helpful. That's right, your, your background is, uh, you came out of Brookline politics, I'm sure it's all Easy, easy and downhill from there. Well, I'm definitely going to be eager to hear from all of you about uh, about fiduciary duty, especially Leo Strine at the at the end of this round of questioning. But let me turn quickly to, to, to Dan Pedrotti. Dan, you guys have been involved in some interesting stuff as well. You were calling on um, Amazon to stop its anti-union campaign and, and their intimidation and tactics in Alabama, a point that President Biden recently intervened on. 
Um, and, and, and you've also been at the cutting edge of these responsible contractor policies. Tell us a little bit about your and, and NAPTU's involvement with both of these things and how it ties into the questions we're discussing today. Sure, and David, thank you for convening this with, uh, with uh, the partners you identified. And great to be with this panel. Um, so, so let me start with Amazon. I think that's an interesting um, example of, of, of um, collective action in the capital markets. And it's actually a campaign that uh, one uh, Senator Marco Rubio has uh, endorsed today in USA Today in support of those workers. But uh, you know, one of my North Stars uh, is that there's power in a union. And, and I think that's both true in the workplace, but, but I think what unites the participants on this um, call are, we, we see the power of collective action on behalf of workers' capital in, in the capital markets. Um, so at Amazon, you have you know, 6,000 workers voting now and, and hopefully standing up to the most powerful, uh, profitable uh, company in the world in the deep South, in, in Bessemer, Alabama, outside of Montgomery. So we were part of a group uh, about a month ago on February 9th uh, that, that called on the company to end its uh, union busting and its intimidation of workers and to remain neutral. And it was a unique uh, coalition of investors too. It was really led by the Swedes, um, it included uh, Bank of Montreal, Global Asset Management, uh, the Church of England's Pensions Board. Um, but, and I'll talk about responsible contractor in a second, you know, it had in the mix uh, the New York City Pension Fund and the New York State Pension Fund, uh, you know, who collectively oversee almost half a trillion dollars of assets. So <clears throat> the, the, the shareholder group on that letter holds about $20 billion of, of Amazon shares. Um, you know, we, we pointed out in addition to the ask around uh, union busting that they're going against their own uh, human rights principles, which talk about you know, respecting rights to join, form uh, a union without reprisal, intimidation, or harassment. So we, you know, we had a, an update from uh, the coalition today. Uh, one of our requests to the company was that they meet with us, meet with the investor coalition. They've so far refused to do that. And, and the, the, the board member we were seeking to meet with is um, a woman named Jamie um, Gorlick, who's a, a US-based attorney uh, actually in DC. But you know, what, why is this important? Well, in, in, in 2020, the um, union membership rate was 10.8% overall, public and private. In, in the private sector, it was 6.3%. And, and you know, that has big impacts on our economy. So I, I wanna actually steal something from Thea Lee and EPI, and this isn't the greatest optics, but look at this chart and tell me if you see a correlation here. The top line, the blue line, is the share of income going to the top 10%. The red line is uh, union density. And we can see that you know, it, it, it's a pretty cl close correlation between compression and, and, and separation. And I think you know, this is really a uh, inequality is, is a cancer on the capital markets if you're long-term patient capital. And, and doing something about private sector uh, uh, voice for workers is incredibly important. And I know that's also where um, uh, Renee's union has led um, let me say a quick word about responsible contractor because you, you mentioned that you know this is responsible contractor policies have been around for for a while for decades i think what's new is in the last two or three years uh, uh, pension funds and then some asset managers have stepped up to really strengthen these policies can you and, tell, and, us, tell us tell our sure. audience briefly what they are please sure so there, there are really efforts to strengthen protections for workers in in um, asset classes like real estate and infrastructure where workers are at their most vulnerable, where they're subject to um, wage theft, misclassification, you know, safety and health violations given what we've gone through in the last uh, year. And, and for the, the pension funds and the, the, the asset managers I'll mention, I think you know, they're worried about headline and reputational risk. Um, what, what's new about responsible contractor policies is it, what, what's stronger about them recently is We've added things like um, labor neutrality, using the Amazon example, uh, and, and thinking about construction union members, Renee's members, you know, janitors and security guards. So, so the owner or the manager is saying they will remain neutral on organizing drives. We've said you know, uh, responsible contractors don't include those who've been debarred by states and cities for cheating workers. We've uh, established um, a, a vehicle for notification on projects. So we in the building trades can encourage our our contractors to bid and get more jobs and work for our members. Um, but I think what's most important about these policies is the pension funds who, who've led this, and it's New York City, New York State, Oregon, and Illinois in the last few years, with, with more in the queue uh, this year. The, the pension funds, the asset owners have said, these protections will, will um, apply when they are limited partners in commingled funds. 
meaning they're asserting their rights as limited partners in a way that we've never seen before. Typically, these policies only um, uh, were enforced or attached when, when an asset owner had a 50%, you know, plus one ownership. So that's really what I think has made it unique. On the, on the asset manager side, we've seen um, uh, firms like Blackstone, Carlisle, uh, Oaktree, and Grovesner step out and adopt them as well. And you know, we think there are more, um, there are more uh, pension funds in the mix as well there. Sorry, on my, on my phone, I just got a call from Tobias Reed of all people from Oregon. So that was the, the hiccup there. But uh, so David, that's I think a good snapshot of where things stand on the RCP front as well. Well, if he's trying to get into the Zoom, we can, we've got a little more room for Tobias <laughs> if, he, if he wants Good. to join us. He, he'd be perfect for this panel. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, as I see it, I mean, uh, to me, what's this is so fascinating, such a fascinating use of labor's capital, right? It's worker capital used in ways to advance the interests of workers as workers, but it also is makes sense from an investment perspective, right? You're investing in companies that are subject to less litigation because you have fewer worker injuries, fewer uh, rights violations on job sites, et cetera, right? And I take it that's how you, that's the framework for you through which you view this data in, in pursuing this work. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we had a fight with the last administration around uh, whether these uh, kinds of issues, environmental, social, and governance are material. Um, you know, th th there was an effort by the Trump administration, I think, to attack and undermine ESG investing and uh, investing in economically targeted ways. Yep. You know, I think we got good news uh, two days ago on Wednesday that the, the, the new DOL uh, with a, a soon to be Secretary Walsh, who, who we're very proud of, um, th that that DOL announced that they're not gonna enforce uh, the rules around ESG, um, economic target investment and proxy voting. And I think the real question that, and, and people like Leo have led on this is, you know, how do we meet the moment and think more ambitiously about changing and updating the law, which is, is badly uh, in need of, of a refresh there. Absolutely, I, and I'm, I'm eager to get into, there's so many great topics to talk about here, but I wanna pivot Dan to Shea Buckmore because some of what you were just saying resonates, I think with a lot of what, you know, Newton does and what Shea does about, you know, you're investing workers' capital in ways that are, that are good for returns and good for workers. And, that strikes me, Shay, as something I've heard you say uh, about what Newton is up to and, and, and what you're up to there. Is that, does, that make, does that sound right to you? Yeah, that's it. spot on, David. Um, you know, I think you know, our, our pedigree and history is in the UK markets and the European markets where you know, institutional owners of assets there have, been, have embraced this sort of investing for a really long time. As we try to grow our business in the U.S., we found that there have been a number of obstacles to sort of embracing that way of looking at the investment landscape. You know, oddly enough, where in Europe you've got regulations actually driving and supporting this type of investing. You know, historically here it, it's been you know almost antagonistic to to managers who are looking to do this. You know, the way we manage money is that we don't view sort of the integration of environmental, social, and governance issues and looking for market rates of return as, as mutually exclusive, right? So I think the narrative here, the prevailing narrative, although it is changing, has been that you can either do one or the other, and it comes at the expense of one another. But that's, you know, we view that as completely false, um, a false dichotomy for sure. I think, you know, our, our way of investing is, is anchored in, in the sense, you know, in the principle of a multi-stakeholder view of the world, right? So, whereas, you know, traditional capitalist uh, finance driven ways of investing have been exclusively focused on the shareholder, right? But that's just one participant in a value chain of different stakeholders, right? And other people, other constituents occupy that value chain. Employees are one of them. Um, communities are another, governments are one, um, and supply chain, things like that. So we view that, you know, the best way of investing actually is, is to look at things more holistically and consider not only environmental impacts and, and shareholder returns, um, but also societal consequences. And only when you actually fuse all those three views together, you get a more comprehensive view of the risks and opportunities um, that will ultimately drive the returns of the companies we invest in. Well, that's a really interesting point, which is just the way that a certain narrow focus only on shareholder returns has actually blinded investors and blinded markets to many sources of value in the, in, in the first place, economic value and other values too. And, and you know, one thing that we keep seeing is these sort of, fee, you know, 
feedback effects from one space into another. You know, when companies run into trouble because they're not paying attention to social issues with regard to their workforce, they're driving inequality, they are not tackling diversity issues, et cetera. That's had, that has feedback effects into how customers feel about that company, into how investors want to invest in that company, into how does the most with does the best talent want to work at that company or go for some go some work somewhere else and so you get these feedback effects that too narrow a view i think can really can really blind you to and it sounds like that's that's what you're saying in terms of how you think about it at newton absolutely yes you know there's a stat that i like to throw out there so so 20 years ago if you looked at the uh, the book value of, of companies in the s p 500 um 70 of that value was in hard assets right so pp and e uh pro, uh um, the buildings, the equipment, uh, property, plants, and equipment. If you fast forward to today, that number is 70% is intellectual capital. So, so intangible assets on the, on, on the book, um, on the balance sheet rather. What that says is that things like brand value, intellectual property, right? The, the people who work in these companies and, 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 the, and the value they create are the more valuable part of, of these companies, right? So the way of looking at these companies, the way of evaluating them has to shift, right? And in and, and the broader sort of perspective one has to look at are things like environmental, social, and governance. How are you treating your employees? Um, what are your policies on diversity and inclusion? Um, what are your policies on, on, on training your, your workforce? Um, uh, for for future for future job opportunities, it's these things that build the brand, build the intellectual property, enhance the value of your employees, um, and ultimately, when when you look at, at at the the power of the employee, no longer are they just an employee occupying a small sliver of you know the, the broad um, um, the broad value chain, but those same employees, through the power of their retirement assets are also shareholders in those companies, right? They can affect the outcomes of those companies through the, the power of their share of their proxy voting. They're also consumers, right? And we know how powerful consumers are these days in terms of wanting to align um, their brand loyalties uh, with their social values as well. Um, and they're also citizens of, of the communities that are giving these companies license to operate, right? So you should respect the value of the employee because they have multiple ways to impact the value of the company. So it's, it's not an us or them argument. It's more of a if we argument. And our way of investing um, incorporates that and looks at it more holistically. It's certainly noteworthy that last year it was Amazon employees who filed a shareholder proposal at Amazon related to what they're doing on climate change, disclosure, et cetera. So these categories continue to blend into each other. And I do just want to quickly know, whenever I've talked to folks who are also investing in, in Europe, it, and I, it'll be interesting to see if there's a big change, there should be, a, there will be a change now in terms of with the Biden administration, but it was very striking the extent to which um, you would talk to European investors who would say, when I'm investing in Europe, it's the regulators who are on my back saying I'm not doing enough about ESG. Right. And when I'm investing in America, it's the regulators who are telling me stop this ESG stuff. It's a breach. You, you know, you're taking your eye off the ball. So it's a fascinating dynamic that I expect probably will improve under Biden. Renee Manley, uh, I, I wanted to turn to you now because you have a uh, you have filed um, shareholder proposals that are going to be voted on this proxy season in the next few months that I think are about as cutting edge on these issues as anything I have heard of. Uh, I'll let you, I'll briefly say what they are, right? Which is you have filed these shareholder proposals at leading financial institutions, the biggest brand name banks out there, calling for a racial equity audit. It's fascinating to think of this coming through the shareholder space into these banking financial institutions. So I'm curious, what was the thinking behind filing these shareholder proposals? Where do you think we're going with them? Please tell, tell us all about it because we're all gonna, and now we can all after this panel, watch what happens, I think, in the next few months with these proposals. Renee. Well, um, so first of all, let me thank you for um, having me be a part of this amazing panel today. Uh, so first, let me tell you what a, a racial equity audit is. Um, a racial equity audit is an independent analysis of a company's business practices in an effort to identify and um, ferret out practices that may have um, a discriminatory effect. Um, an audit could also evaluate um, the company's current um, efforts or efforts in response to the 
um, events of last summer. And so uh, we decided to file um, the shareholder proposals at these financial institutions, um, primarily because there's been a kind of a history of, uh, let's say, challenging performance and impacts on communities of color by um, a litany of um, banking and financial institutions. Uh, I think um, many of, almost all of these financial institutions made commitments following the incidents of last summer and made significant financial commitments um, in addressing uh, you know, um, the incidents of last summer. And given their troubling history, you know, I think when our team kind of looked at the commitments that were made, we were like, well, where are they getting this expertise from? Like they're throwing all this money. They have this troubling history. Like, how is this gonna happen? How are they gonna be in effective? And as investors, we were kind of like, wow, this is problematic, right? Like they're allocating all of these resources to addressing this issue when they have had a very, let's say, challenging history of addressing, um, you know, um, discriminatory practices and policies, right? Mm -hmm. So we felt that um, a racial equity audit um, was just really one way to make sure that, first of all, that they were addressing the the appropriate problem and challenges and that they were allocating the resources because um, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars appropriately because as investors we want to make sure that these you know business enterprises are sustainable over the long term um, we understand that you know these issues are around you know um, you know equity diversity um, are not going to go away. They're only going to, be, going to become more prevalent. And as um, you know, other folks on the call have indicated, this is something that you know, um, you know, investors are, are are really conscious of. People are paying attention to. Um, it's a part of, of when folks are evaluating a brand, they're they're they are they are looking for the response um, on these issues. And so um, we want to make sure that. The company was really addressing this in a way that is appropriate and um, in a way that was responsible to their long-term sustainability. I'm curious to hear, how did they respond to you when you came to them with these proposals? Well, without you know getting into specifics, I think that um, for the most part, um, they responded um, you know, by, you know, addressing the issues around workforce diversity and board diversity, um, addressing, you know, some of their philanthropic activities, um, but not really addressing, you know, the issues that were pointing out in the proposal as it was presented. Um, and I think, you know, for us, uh, it really indicated to us that, you um, the, the challenge that we saw and the reason for um, for filing the resolution. You know, we know that there are like existing um, regulatory requirements like, you know, the CRA, um, the CFPB, um, and even that, you know, there may be in some cases um, board or director um, oversight um, in this area. But what we are really clear is that um, while there may be competent and experienced and very intelligent people on this board, most of, in almost every case, um, board members have not been recruited because they have civil rights or racial justice expertise. And so the most important part for us of this racial justice or racial equity audit is really having the independent audit. And I think that's the part that the uh, institutions that we've um, been in dialogue with have had the most problem with. Um, and it's like, you can't evaluate yourself. You can't look in the mirror at yourself and really come back with an unbiased opinion. Having the independent look, having experienced folks who are, 
um, have that civil rights expertise is really essential to getting the type of recommendations um, to present to these financial institutions. And we think that that is um, a really non-negotiable point. And who do you think are you, who, who do you expect to be the allies? Who do you expect to be voting with you on these shareholder proposals? And how do you engage with other shareholders about, about this issue and these, and, and, and these proposals in particular? Well, we look at this proposal just as we look at other proposals. Um, we will be filing, you know, um, proxy solicitations and soliciting votes in that way. We will be holding, um, you know, uh, webinars for investors to join us uh, with experts um, in the civil rights community who can explain uh, their points of view, as well as uh, with, uh, you know, fellow investors who, um, and, and economists who can share our, 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 the points around the, um, around the racial equity audits, as well as um, experts who have conducted racial equity audits at other institutions. Thea, thank you, Renee. So Thea, you, you're an economist with a long time affiliation with the labor movement. And I'm just really curious if you could give us some broader perspective here on the role that this kind of institutional investor activism, labor's capital activism, plays in these broader concerns we have in the labor movement about worker voice, about diversity, equity, and inclusion. What are your thoughts on the role that this kind of activism can play here? Thank you, David, and thanks so much for including me in this tremendous panel. It's been a pleasure to listen to everybody's points of view. So I, I think that the institutional investor voice is essential. It's an essential element in the toolbox of all the different places where you can apply leverage to a company uh, that is or isn't listening. But it, it's a way I think also of, um, of, of conveying to government and to the public at large that there is a business interest in addressing these issues of fairness, uh, racial inclusion, and so on. That that it isn't just that we we don't have a situation where workers and business are at each other's throats and everything's a zero sum game. But instead, when institutional investors raise their voices to say this is in our interest also to have rules of the game that are fair, so that we all know what we're playing with then it's, it's something that I think allows policymakers to see things a little bit differently, to open their minds a little bit. And as you said, I was at the labor movement, I was in the AFL-CIO for 20 years. And I, I know that whenever we could say there are shared interests by business and labor, that's something that could allow a lot of policymakers to kind of take a deep breath and take a step back and to, to feel some comfort that, that this is something where they could see the shared interests and so on. So I think that's just a really important piece of the institu institutional investors uh, voice. And how is, I mean, how do we get to this point? I mean, where it's um, so often been depicted as an antagonistic or adversarial relationship. And I, I mean, I can certainly see the role of institutional investors in trying to shift that conversation. That makes a ton of sense because I think a lot of people, in fact, even one of the questions I saw, uh, you know, in, in the Q&A was, isn't inclusive capitalism an oxymoron? You know, some people look at this and think, you know, aren't investors the problem, right, are originally the problem? That's the typical conception. And I think we've all seen some evidence here. And I see a lot of heads going like this, which which I agree with. Right. Um, it does, they don't have to be right. And, and so 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 you're emphasizing the way institutional investors can can shift this conversation, do, how, do we, how do we get out of that dynamic about the zero sum game, do you think? Well, that's a great question. And I, I do think that this has changed over the last 20 years or so that maybe in the, the olden days when I started the AFL-CIO, it was more common to have shared labor business interests on certain issues like around training or infrastructure investment. And you know, we would, when we could, we would put together a labor business coalition. And then over the last 20 or so years, you saw more and more polarization and people kind of digging in. And I would argue to you that even from the point of view of a lot of businesses, that it went too far, that in some ways business was too successful in ramming a, a certain agenda down of not looking at, as Shay was talking about, the, you know, the, the broader stakeholder interest, but looking very narrowly at the next quarter and profits. 
and seeing anything that might, uh, might get in the way of that as being an obstacle. So workers or unions or decent wages or any kind of constraints around racial equity was a problem. And in the end, I don't think it actually served business as well as it could have, because what we did see is we didn't have tremendous economic growth and there was a lot of inequality. And so you have a distributional piece and you have a growth piece. And what I think would be great is to see us get back to a different place where we can have more shared prosperity, more equitable growth, and that in the end, that's actually more stable for business and, um, and, and can be a, a different model. But it does require a change in approach. It requires last, more of a partnership and less of an adversarial piece. Last question for you, Thea, before I tur turn to Leo, which is, um, you know, how much of this would you attribute to the kind of the rise of shareholder primacy ideology versus, you know, more concrete, you know, factors? I think it's a little bit of both for sure, David, um, that, you know, on the one hand, and maybe these things feed each other, that you have the shareholder primacy or the short term profit seeking. Um, and and then you, you did have a rise of a certain set of um, right wing kingmakers in the political sphere that that really at the state level at the federal level you know were in an all, saw themselves in an all out war to defeat the labor movement to bust unions to put in place right to work and so on and um, and you know i think they enjoyed that extra power but at the same time it came at a cost and the cost was what we see during the pandemic which is the fragility of this economy and the dramatic inequality which in the end makes all of us less prosperous and less safe. You know, if, if, if the, the most vulnerable workers in society don't have paid sick leave or health care, we're all gonna get sick. And, you know, so, so that's, I think, the, um, the trade-off that, that we've seen and that maybe was, was really laid bare during the pandemic. I, to your last point, I, I received a, a note from a, a teacher, a uh, union leader that I know, uh, who, who informed me to, that Arkansas, the legislature in Arkansas today, seems to have adopted some kind of legislation or has moved in the direction of adopting legislation that would be one more state to strip away collective bargaining rights for public employees. So that continues to, to evolve on the ground right now. Leo Strine, I, I wanna bring you into this uh, conversation um, as the business law judge. And you've also recently written two very interesting and provocative articles one calling for ways to enhance worker voice inside the corporation and another talking about fiduciary duty and diversity. So you've recently put deep scholarly thought into both of the topics we have here today. I wanted to get your reactions to what we've just been talking about. And also maybe you can put it in a bit of a fiduciary duty framework since that's come up already. It'd be very interesting to hear what someone as recently influential on the Delaware uh, uh, judiciary as you were thinks about these topics no, legal no I, i'd be happy to and i i think we put a little bit of a sunny gloss on the role of institutional investors in this uh, process and i want to give a shout out to thea's organization at epi which has done such great economic work on the distributional changes in our economy over time and the way to really visualize this is there's been one big arrow going way up, and that's been the power of institutional investors and the immediate desires of the stock market over public companies. And another pointing way down, which has been the power of stakeholders over companies, the power of external regulation to check externalities, and in particular, the decline in, in, in protection for workers' rights to collectively bargain. There's the decline in the floor that's put under bargaining by the minimum wage has been profound. Um, and so when you have, it's not unexpected, it's quite natural that when one interest gets much more powerful and another interest um, gets weaker, that the powerful interest is gonna run out. And there's been plenty, some people say, oh, we haven't grown enough new pie. That's just nonsense. And the reality is there's been plenty of new pie. I mean, we're not inventing things as transformational as indoor plumbing and the refrigerator. The new version of the iPhone is not that much cooler than the old version, but there's been plenty of new pie. What's the problem? 
is that the share of the pie that used to be shared with the people most responsible for capitalist, the capitalist system success, the workers, has gone profoundly down. This has been hugely a factor in contributing to inequality and also divisiveness. And it particularly hit black workers because if you look at the, the black workers didn't get full labor rights until the civil rights movement during the Johnson administration. Um, and when the New Deal Great Society consensus held and black people were being included, there were gains in, for black people and there was reduced inequality. When the embracement, embrace of the Freedman Doctrine um, by, and Lewis Powell by Ronald Reagan came into four, that since then we've had growing inequality, reversal of the gains for black people and in resulting insecurity. And someone mentioned, as you said about capitalism, capitalism without guardrails is what failed. Capitalism with guardrails, with the New Deal and with European social democracy, which was modeled on the UD, New Deal and the similar things in Australasia and Canada is what brought shared prosperity to the world. And it made the capitalist system, a market system work for everyone. It's what defeated communism and fascism. But unfortunately, and I think that, you know, we're gonna focus on institutional investors. Frankly, many public pension funds, even union affiliated funds, I see my friend Dan, we know this, pushed managed to the market policies on companies as a way to punish companies. Get rid of your classified board, get rid of your defenses. Let's have annual say on pay votes. Well, that stuff has resulted, David, in squeezing workers in greater externality risk. And people also forget about the Friedman Doctrine. There was two things. They went to war on the regulatory state. People, forget, the first time you heard the name Gorsuch wasn't when Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch was nominated. It's when his mother was the female counterpart to Jim Watt in trying to take apart environmental regulation. There's been a war on the guardrails in capitalism and particularly on labor since the 1980s. And the institutional investor community is systematically part of, of aiding and abetting that. And the Democratic Party, to be honest, uh, uh, being subjected to money, uh, raising money from hedge funds and Wall Street and things like that, has not called out that sort of thing and in the way that it should have. And you'll see Democratic legislators who complain about stock buybacks, right, Renee? They stuck about they don't like buybacks, they don't like all this stuff, but they support all the managed to the market policies that have made public companies play things. So I think if we're going to be mature about this, we have to deal with the power allocation. It's not just words, but words do matter. So embracing stakeholder governance, I think, David, important thing. Can we move towards the benefit corporation model, which would cohere our model more like the EU, where you'd have a shall duty to stakeholders? But even I would say you all, I, I, you know, I believe there should be an extra E. ESG is not a high minded term. It's as um, weak as the term progressive. The term progressive was used by people who were scared of Ronald Reagan and wouldn't be identified as liberals. So they identified a term by Teddy Roosevelt. Many people younger than me don't know that, but if you lived through the Reagan years, that's what it was. You were too chicken blank to be a liberal. Well, ESG was the investor oriented word for corporate social responsibility. And it's no coincidence that until 2020, and till people started, you know, like me and Dan Pergrati and Renee and other people on this call started pushing about workers that frankly, there wasn't much in the ESG policies of these investors around workers. And I was told the workers were buried in the S, which I thought was a perfect metaphor, David. So I'd embrace everybody I see, Deborah, from, I'd love to see the Democratic state treasurers and people who care about workers start using double ESG um, and because words matter and to make sure that workers are at the forefront of disclosures. But I think when you put pressure, what I mean by that is take them out of the S and make sure that employee factors are clearly part of EESG disclosure. If you look at the SEC disclosures, you don't see much focus on human capital. If you look at Vanguard and State Street, they're behind in advocating for that. Words matter. And there's no company that can be a good citizen unless it's good to the people who work for it. And so I think that's, th those things matter. 
requiring the institutions, oh, David, I'm just going to say this, requiring yep. the institutions themselves to disclose whether their stewardship activities actually cohere with their woke rhetoric. Are they actually giving input to companies when it matters, when they're, put, when they're meeting with them? Is it really about ESG and are they supporting them in sustainability or are they using that as public rhetoric? And then when it comes to voting on activist campaigns or other things, they're actually voting on total stock return the immediate year. You can't expect the companies to do better by their workers or stakeholders unless the institutional investors and particularly the ones who have working people's money do that. And that's also important because working people invest in broad portfolios. They don't benefit from externality growth. They benefit when the entire company, the country goes forward in a productive way. They own the whole economy and their ability to save for the future um, turns on that focus. And that's why to, to sit in the framework, the framework really tried to focus on increasing worker voice at all companies, supporting labor law reform, but also experimenting with like a workforce committee within companies to give more, um, put that, to put a floor under bargaining as we talked about with the living wage, um, but to, to actually require institutional investors to just to be part of the solution and have mandatory obligations too and not just tell the companies that make real products and deliver real services that they should do better. Well, there was a lot there that was really fascinating and provocative, Leo, as always. A couple things come to mind. I know Renee was talking about sort of gaps between rhetoric and reality in this space, gaps between the fact that, say, the business roundtable comes out and makes, all, makes pronouncements about Black Lives Matter, but then doesn't back a minimum wage you know, and trying to find tools like the Cheryl proposals. Sure. But I mean, also think about the G. Have these have these institutional investors updated their G policies mm -hmm. to go along with their supposed policies around social, environmental and employee factors? Or do their G policies still basically subject companies to the pressures all the time of, of activists and other things that that is alignment? You know, and it's not just companies that struggle with hypocrisy. The institutional investors banging on a company for two years about its returns, then an environmental problem happens because they were under pressure. You know, that's not attractive. Being on the journey together, focusing on sustainable growth. Why is it, for example, does anybody on this call think we should be paying CEOs year to year? So why do we have a swamp of, of say on pay votes every year that are, are dictated by proxy advisors? It's a tool of the activists. Why not have them on a cycle of what each company has a vote every four years, genuinely on a long-term plan and thoughtful voting? All these tools that make it, I call it corporate California, great state to live in, but their state government was messed up by going from a republic to a direct democracy where there was referendums on everything. How is it that we think that companies are gonna be able to focus on sustainable growth if any time something goes wrong, there can be an immediate referendum and the marginal traders dictate the outcomes. And so I think we need to push for alignment between the long-term investors and the long-term investors and the horizon they have is, is identical to workers. And this false idea that workers don't want their companies to succeed is crazy because they only can have a job if the company does well. And there are companies, I think I'm gonna say, we've been there, there are a lot of companies who are trying to do the right thing. It's not difficult. It's not always easy when you're under pressure. And, and, and I think Thea said something about level playing fields. You know, when you, everybody has to pay a living wage, that helps the good companies. When there's strong environmental regulation, that helps the companies that do the right thing. And when you don't have those guardrails, and you have to compete against somebody. Anybody play sports on this call? I think a lot of us do. If you have a referee who doesn't manage the game, it's not like everybody becomes more of a gentle person. They start kicking each other, right? By the end of the match, you do it to survive. And business is, comp is competitive. And I think a lot of what we're talking about here in the framework and in my college is a restoration, much more than a revolution mm -hmm. of a way of managing our economy that works better for everybody, but making sure that it really works for everyone this time. And I want to say something about living wage and about wage equity and how it affects um, social harmony. 
precisely because black people were excluded, that they tend to be more in the working class in the emerging middle class. If you increase wages and wages, you're gonna have a disproportionately beneficial effect on black Americans and on closing the race gap. But you're also gonna do another thing, which is struggling white workers and struggling white communities will benefit from that too. And so the ability for demagogues to divide us along racial lines, to divide the working class will go down. And that was what was happening during the Great Society New Deal. Is, and when everybody has more economic security, you, you start that you can bring out the better angels of your nature. There's less reason for discontent and it knits us together for a society. And I think a lot of what's divided us um, is because of that. And last year just put a point on that inequality because the worst off workers were, getting in, the one, were the ones we needed the most to keep us together and they're getting the shaft and more of them were black people. So Leah, do you want to jump in on this? I, and I've seen a lot of nodding heads. So let's open it up to conversation. Let's go to Fia and then Deborah and then Renee. Right, I'm dying to jump in. So thank you, uh, Leo, for that um, powerful presentation. And I totally agree with you in terms of what we need are enforceable rules of the road that only the government can do. So to the you know the the point at which institutional investors voice is important is if they are contributing to the um the pressure on on the government and if you think about two big pieces of legislation that are on the docket this year the raise the wage act raising the minimum wage to 15 dollars by 2025 and the pro act the protecting the right to organize act those are the two pieces that are actually struggling in the current congress because they're not you know didn't fit into the reconciliation easily but they are so essential because the key thing, as you say, is power and organizing a union, having the right to be a, a part of a union is an absolutely essential thing. And we do see that unions have a disproportionate impact on helping especially black workers and Latino workers because a, a union at its best uh, can really make sure that everybody has the benefit and that those wages, but also the minimum wage uh, disproportionately helps black workers and Latino workers. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, maybe we should have a regional minimum wage. A regional minimum wage, in my view, locks in the, the racial gaps that we see right now. You don't want to have a permanent uh, disadvantage. Well, it's also, Thea, right? There's no place that $15 is too much. And there's everywhere, almost everywhere, it's not enough. And it may be a time frame, but I was wondering what your views were, because Dan and I have talked about this and we struggle with it on the on the commission is there's a binary choice now for workers you have a lot of worker voice if you have a union company and you have nothing and in and we don't have works councils or whatever in the us and one of the things that our framework did was to argue that both for labor law reform we didn't endorse specifically we worked really hard to get a consensus we, did, we didn't get an endorsement of this the pro act per se but everybody supported revitalizing the national labor relations act as a combination of labor law reform and something inside the company to give more focus at the board level to workers. And that's why we called for a workforce committee at the board level. And I don't know what you think about that. We didn't view it as those as substitutes. We viewed them as complements that would amplify the voice of, of labor and would also frankly give other workers some more involvement and interest in joining a union. Um, I think we need to move forward on every front because workers are so disempowered. And as, as Dan said, union density is so low right now. We really need to make sure that we can uh, turbocharge uh, workers' voice at the workplace, both through definitely the PRO Act and also certainly like to see companies do the right thing, recognize their unions, stop fighting, stop spending so much money fighting a union and spend that money instead on better wages and health care. Deborah, did you want to jump in on this? <laughs> You're still muted. Okay, let's start with few. <laughs> I immediately wanted to turn to Leo and say, um, great stuff. Um, but you know, the kind of grosser bread and butter person that I am, want it all broken down into an action item list. So some of the things, um, theoretically, if we're talking philosophically, I agree with everything. However, I don't agree with all of it, in fact, in action as defining 
each and every institutional investor and how they are operating today. For example, um, the Democratic treasurers, we are working with, um, with the unions now, but they're it, within our own group, we have different levers of power. Some of us are sole fiduciaries and can just do something like that. Others of us have to deal with the board. And I saw in the questions, for example, someone challenging and saying the workers need to be on the board. In Massachusetts, they are. They're both on the retirement board and they're on the pension fund. They're all represented. So I wanted to make something like that clear, but maybe not in other states. And that's why I'm saying there are a lot of broad strokes here, but we then need to break it down for action items with um, for each individual investor, because what's happening is you're blending so many things together. Well, and but but, De but Deborah, can I just say this? If you look at public companies now, for most public companies, and I Dan will tell you this, there are 10 investors that control the majority of their stock, and it's three to four. And so we're talking about the investors, the Black Rocks, the State Streets, the Vanguards, the Fidelities, the T. Rowe Prices, who have working people's money, and having them have to align their interest in their stewardship policies with diversified investors oh, and to be able, and, and that's what we're talking about really. And, and, but not, but you have to understand, and, and Renee knows more about what we're doing at DTA, the Democratic Treasurers Association. So we're working with NAB2, we're working with SEIU, we're working with unions, with the, with the trades, with everyone across the country, and we represent a huge amount of money. And yes, we're behind the curve because these large investors have dominated, but we're challenging those investors also. We may not have all the levers in place yet, but I feel that we're, we're growing in power. I mean, Renee can address a lot of this, but we've made an impact recently on some of the things we've done with Amazon, with Marathon Petroleum XPO, and many others. Um, and, and so I think that um, what you're saying, if, if, you, if, you, if you look at it in the complete picture you're talking about, you're gonna overwhelm um, the story and you, we've got to take the pieces that we've already developed and keep it moving forward and grow the movement. And that's what I'm trying to say. Renee, I, yeah, I want to hear from you guys. So, yeah. yeah, so I wanted to address it um, as well. So first of all, you know, like those large asset members, asset managers are the very ones where we file, um, some of those are the very ones where we file the racial equity audit resolutions because of their outside impact, um, you know, um, in the equities market. I mean, that's just it. They're, their impact is large and it's only going to grow. And so um, understanding and having them, you know, do the racial equity audit to look at their policies and practices and the impact on specifically on communities of color is just something we feel like needs to be done to examine, you know, both their sustainability and to address it now um, before their impact grows even more significant, right? So that's one thing. The second thing um, is, you know, um, you know, looking at kind of like the what companies say and the what companies do um, issues um, and where they can really um, begin to have um, an impact on issues and policies right now. Um, so the things that Thea mentioned, right, the PRO Act and the wage, Raise the Wage Act, but like, look at what's happening right now in this country where they are basically trying to tear apart democracy and take us back to the post Jim Crow era and voting rights. And any of these companies right now, if they spoke up and said that we are against the erosion of voting rights in Georgia or, or anywhere, um, if, if BlackRock, or, or JP Morgan spoke out against that, I would say that that would be a sea change and it would stop it in its track. But, but I've heard crickets. Right. The same thing about the $15 minimum wage, but yet, you know, 
they want to argue that Black Lives Matter, um, like I, you know, like, you know, this is my personal opinion, but I just don't think those things reconcile. I just don't see how they, they reconcile. And, you know, I, so besides the, you know, the corporate board diversity and your employee training initiatives, that is, those are the kinds of things that have real and sustaining impacts on communities and on our democracy. And I would say on our economy, I don't know what hindering voting rights, um, you know, I am not the economist, DS probably has data on this, but I would say that that will probably have a chilling effect on our economy. Just saying. Well, amen, Renee. And just a couple more things to echo. And I wanna go back to Leo's point about um, uh, we've met the enemy and it's us. Because I think it, it is fair to say that for some institutional investors, uh, you know, they remain part of the problem and they were part of accelerating the framework that led to this problem, right? So, so I'm gonna be unpopular and, and, and name some names here too. Um, uh, Calsters, right? Cal I, I worked closely with Calsters when I was at the American Federation of Teachers. We have a trustee on there. It, it's a fund, unfortunately, that has poured money into hedge funds. And I think part of what we want to talk about with, with, with uh, Leo's bill is solutions here. But, you know, Calsters, whether it's, you know, fueling the, the sort of predatory nature of hedge funds or um, not even having an enforceable responsible contractor policy, this is a this is a plan that's that's investing in the long-term interest of teachers. And, and we can't get them to begin to step up around responsible contractor like the other funds I mentioned. They own a construction company that is regularly picketed by labor that has problems on the operations side as well. So, so Leo's right. I think there were lots of unintended consequences to the sort of shareholder privacy. There were plenty of cheerleaders and there are institutions that, that remain part of the problem, which is why I think the solution is important. And you know, we at, at the building trades are, are big fans of what um, uh, Leo has put together. It's a bill called the Fair and, Sustainable, Fair and Sustainable Capitalism Act. But we talked about the workforce committee. The others that I think are important are, after identifying the problems, modernizing fiduciary duty so we can consider beneficiaries human interests in, in jobs and ethical companies. More often than not, when fiduciaries, except for Deb and, and the more um, uh, the more visionary members of, of her treasurer class, more often than not, when, when, when uh, fiduciaries raise these issues, they're shut down and said, and told, you're gonna violate your fiduciary duty, you're personally liable, they'll take your house. We gotta modernize fiduciary duty. The other thing that Leo's bill does is, is strengthen uh, disclosure requirements for hedge funds. So when they build up a staking company, we, we know that sooner. And, and lastly, to echo Renee's point about you know, voting rights and, and the flood of, of um, dark money, you know, it would it would also get the the, the Bogle rule uh, implemented. The companies where if a company is going to spend money on a uh, you know a certain senator from Missouri, they got to get three quarters of their shareholders to approve it because otherwise they're just looting the corporate treasury uh, at at the expense of all of the rest of us who are patient capital. So, um, Leo's hey, Dan, always was you, effectively Dan, provocative. Dan, and you, I wanted Dan, to you that. might want to talk about private companies too, and. Yeah. Okay. And that too, because that's a big issue I know for all of you, because you're invested through indirectly and then, and they employ a lot of people and we don't know much about them. I mean, private equity is a challenge. I think we're trying to make inroads with the Carlisle's and Blackstones of the world, but we have more work to do. I know Deb said, you know, back when she was uh, a business school student, she was writing about the, you know, barbarians at the gate and the KKRs of the world. I think, you know, private equity owns everything now. And we have a heck of a lot more work to do on the private equity front, just like we do on the hedge fund front as well. And, and well, we don't and want Dan, to hurt more and Dan, public you and I private. About, Dan, yeah, you we and have I to get a handle about, on private equity. Renee equity, has you know, for, for our about trustees. requiring Deborah right, Renee, requiring, oh. requiring disclosure from private companies of their ESG treatment, so that companies of a certain size would actually talk about how they treat their workers, how they treat the environment. So there'd be a level play, again, that level playing field that Bia is talking about why when a company goes private or a Cargill, it's one thing to not do all the disclosures that a public company has, but to not tell us about your ESG policies leaves regulators, public and investors, and the workers at those companies in the, in, without adequate information. Right. Yeah, I think we have to do a lot better on, on, on private markets, uh, specifically on private equity. I think we saw this um, most recently, um, you know, over the last year during the pandemic, um, when we, you know, really saw, you know, um, 
in the news of the private equity nursing homes and what was happening there and, and, and folks not being able to get information about what was happening there. Um, and it's not just in nursing homes. I mean, private equity employs as many folks as, 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 as public companies, but we're not able to get any information about what's going on um, around, you know, whether it's governance issues or um, environmental issues or social issues. And, um, and it makes it difficult. I serve as a trustee on our, our fund. We don't have a lot of exposure on private equity, but I know for our public sector trustees, it's increasingly difficult for them to get any type of information uh, mm -hmm. when they're making investments on private equity, and that has to change. Um, they cannot really do their duties as, as, as a fiduciary um, when they, um, private equity um, is shielded um, from, um, from disclosing information to, to the fund itself and specifically to the trustees. Shay, did you wanna, I don't mean to put it, but did you wanna comment on, on any of these points that were just being made? Yeah, there's a there's a lot to unpack in what's been said, you know, and and, and provocative, but but spot on in, in many ways. Um, I think when we uh, we started the conversation, I mentioned you know how things had progressed in Europe, and and it was the large institutional asset owners that started the process there, right? So you had people who understood who the constituents were, the workers, their communities, and understood that the the sovereign wealth funds, the the assets of these funds, had to be managed in a way that drove a sustainable way of life for everyone. Investment managers understood that. The asset, the asset owners dictated to asset managers, this is what you're going to have to do in order to get our money. Asset managers then responded to that and regulatory pressures then coalesced around all of these movements and, and gave them sort of sustainable momentum. I think here, when we look at the states, the same thing is happening here. It could happen faster, but I think capital markets are actually working properly in this in this regard in that asset owners are starting to make these issues primary in how they're allocating assets investment managers like us and others in our industry are responding right so you know esg it, it's not an outcome it's it's a way of categorizing relevant issues and you know those issues and employees are you know top of top of mind how employees are treated security well-being respective employees um uh equal pay, um, you know, job training, um, job security, um, retirement benefits. These are all things that are inputs into how we are making investment decisions. For a long time, these issues have been ignored, right? There was a cost to not addressing these issues face um, head on. And these externalities have not been borne by the companies. What's happening now, whether it takes a pandemic, whether it takes the rise of populist governments is that these costs, these externalities are now being borne by companies and they're responding as well they should in a properly functioning capital, you know, uh, capital market. I, I acknowledge it's not happening as quickly as, 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 as we would like, but I think the mechanisms for companies, asset owners, consumers, employers to respond to these catalysts is, is working. Um, and you know something that's been brought up a couple of times it, in terms of disclosure, that's one of the things we drive for and push for in proxy voting is that your 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 corporate actions, um, your your governance structures have to reflect what you're saying to the market. And this is something that actually drives a lot of managers in the space. We're looking for for a clear um, uh, sort of clear articulation of what your E S and G sort of policies are what your governance policies are, how you treat your employees, what you're doing about the environment. And we're judging you on your ability to execute against those guidelines, right? And I think capital is moving towards the companies that are actually able to articulate that clearly and execute as well. So I do think, you know, there are parts of the system that are broken, but let's not ignore the progress that, that we've made collaboratively because asset owners, investment managers have worked together in a capitalist framework to drive change, right? So this, you know, we've said that shareholders have, 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 have dominated the dialogue for a long time, but as I said at the onset, this is a multi-stakeholder view, right? So this has to be a fully inclusive uh, drive for change. And I do think we are on the way. You know, I will reiterate, it's, it perhaps is not happening as fast as it could, but I think the pieces are in place, the catalysts are in place. The fact that we're having this panel with, with the broad representation of people here is a testament to the fact that yeah, we we get it, right? And and we're we're moving towards that progress. 
Uh, is, and let me just say, by the way, this is the time is just flying here. And I am I want to acknowledge that I, there are many questions in the Q&A. And fortunately, I think many of them have been spontaneously answered in the course of this uh, of, of this conversation. Um, uh, are, who are people pushing? How do people let's so there's a number of different questions. Matthew Bodie, professor, uh, law professor asks, um, you know, I, I find it very frustrating. Workers have no governance voice in the running of the business of the corporations, political speech, donations and others. Are any of your organizations interested in actual employee representation and governance like co-determination? I think the challenge is, um, and, and Leo can speak on this for a while, I think we, we need to have an on-ramp to get to co-determination. And I, I think there will be an upcoming law review article to that point. Um, but we think that idea of a workforce committee is a good start to, to build the proof of concept, to build voice. I mean, Thea mentioned this in terms of partnerships. I mean, we have partnerships within the building trades with a number of different industries, you know, in the energy sector, in the pharmaceutical sector, in, in the capital sector. Um, but you know, we, we're not going to go from zero to nirvana uh, in corporate governance overnight. We, we know what that that model looks like in Germany. It works, but we've got to we've got to build stepping stones there. And I think that's why for us, the workforce committee is a good uh, bridge to that uh, and, and builds on some of the work we're already doing with companies or industries as well. Um, but, you know, we can't we can't get there with uh, uh, the snap of our fingers, unfortunately. So what do we think? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. SEIU is definitely in favor of sectoral bargaining. Um, that is one of our frameworks that we love. Um, and, you know, that is where we want to eventually end up. Yeah. I'm just saying on a personal note that at the Economic Policy Institute, I am a boss, I am the boss, and EPI is a unionized workforce. And we actually just this year added a union member to our board of directors, uh, a voting slot. And it's something that I think is really good for the organization when you have a constructive, productive commu communication, two-way communication with your union, with your workers, it's something that can actually help management, um, you know, so troubleshoot and foresee problems and so on. So I hope that is a direction we'll be going. I think the, you know, the proposals around sectoral bargaining are an important way of uh, trying to bring the benefits of collective bargaining and uh, collective action to more workers more quickly, because we know that until we fix our broken labor laws, it is so challenging for workers to try to form a union um, at, at, a, at a workplace that, um, that it, it can be very slow, it can be very expensive. So we want to both fix the broken labor laws that we have with the PRO Act, but also I you know, certainly encourage companies to start moving in that direction. There's nothing that stops companies from doing what we did, put a, a worker representative, a union representative on your board. So we have a question from uh, Professor Chuan from the um, Asian Center for Corporate Governance, who's asking about how do, we, what, well, how do we chart the path from shareholder privacy to stakeholder democracy? And I wanna use this question to sort of ask you as we kind of you know, begin our, our closing our closing out. We still have 10 minutes, but you know, if you have, what's on your wish list? We've touched a little bit. We've heard some things. We've heard fiduciary duty. We've heard reforming labor law. We've heard workers on corporate boards. What's your wish list for the next say five years or for the duration of at least, uh, you know, the, 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 the Biden administration? What's, your, what's on your wish list for how we move things in the right direction uh, at institutional investors and really even more broadly, if you care to comment? Anybody want to jump on that? I'll jump on it. Um, we need to broaden the authority of the SEC to require ESG disclosure of both uh, public companies and, and pro large private companies to even that playing field and not create a perverse incentive for more companies to go private. We need to modernize the regulatory framework of the Department of Labor to authorize all institutional investors to consider EESG factors and to align their stewardship policies with the, the real interest of their investors and to require certain types of investors, those who have retirement money and index funds to actually consider the real nature of them. We need to have modernize our disclosure requirements so that activist investors actually have to come public with full information about their derivative positions and others like they do in the OECD and not come public with 20% of the, of the company. 
We need to, the workforce committee that Dan talked about would be a building block towards labor voice in worker voice in companies without unions. As Thea said, we need the core elements of the PRO Act and the Democratic, um, the bare majority in the Senate needs to be very supple and nimble to identify those core elements and to find a way to get it done. Um, this year, we need the living wage um, to set a floor under bargaining. I think what Renee said about sectoral bargaining, what Dan and I would tell you about the co-determination, it's a ground up system that goes with the work, works councils, greater union voice and sectoral bargaining. It's not just putting people isolated on boards. So those building blocks are, are really important and supporting the president and a transformational infrastructure package that would put would retrain workers. It's really important that, that we not vilify the workers or the people who manage uh, energy producing companies. We all rely on energy. We need to have an assurance for their workers that they have a future and that we need to move them from the, 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 the carbon energy sector to other energies. And we need to show as a nation that we're committed to being on the journey together. And I think if we do those things, and frankly, we could fund that with patient capital taxation. If you close the carry interest loophole, adopt a fractional trading tax. And to be honest, if we do some sensible processing on carbon, we'd have a lot of money to pour into real growth. And that could be a, a way that would really align our economy with the interest of everyone um, and, and create a more sustainable economy. And it will create, it will broaden the, the investor class too for the benefit of people who manage money because Americans need to be able to save. And the only way that working people can save is with higher wages. Although I'll finish with this, I have one creative idea. I'd love to see all the companies that match 401k. I'd like them to commit to take the first thousand dollars that they would have spent towards matches and give it gratis to every employee so that every employee plus a living wage would get a thousand dollars towards retirement. And then anything plush that could go into the match, but to start building wealth for savings among poor people. I think if there were ways to do some tax incentives around that, David, um, and to have companies focus their matching funds towards the, you know, by actually giving people who don't have the money to put that first money, that, that first savings in there could be a very helpful thing in closing the wealth gap, particularly for black people and other poor people. Can we close the wealth gap without also expanded share, share ownership? I, I think you can't get to share ownership. Even if you look at middle-class people, teachers, cops, I think Dan and other people will tell you, it's very difficult for them to even get to their 401k and the, the, the limits. And so when you're talking about people at the end, you really need something. And, and if we're gonna to go to a defined contribution, having something put every year from the employer and, and sure, give an incentive to match after that, David, but give them the first thousand, you know, something. But, but the wage gap for these families is so formidable that to expect them to, to, to save for the long term, I think it's shocking if you look at the, 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 the numbers and Thea's, the Economic Policy Institute has this, the wealth gap, you know, it's just very hard for families. And, and so we need to close that. And, and along with the living wage, something that we could do about that would create an investor class because it's only until you get an adequate salary that you really have a little extra to put aside for your kid's college retire, your retirement and your kid's college education. We've got four minutes. I'd love to hear a final comment from each of you quickly. Thea. Okay, that was a great list, Leo. And I actually wanted to just add one quick thing to it. You talked about a transformational infrastructure package. And I know Renee is gonna nod when I say this, which is that we wanna make sure that that infrastructure includes care infrastructure. And I think that's one of the things that we can do right now to make sure that we have a, a, both a robust and an equitable recovery from the pandemic, because we know that the people who were hit hardest were the lowest wage workers, women workers and uh, workers of color and building out the care economy, but also making sure that we are professionalizing the care workforce and paying them at the rate that they need, giving them union representation, giving them that support, I think would be a tremendous, um, a tremendous service, a transformational change too. So I just wanted to add that friendly amendment to your long and great list. Thank you. Thank you, David. Shay, final comment? Oh, you're muted. I think uh, the pandemic and what it exposed about um, uh, wage disparities and how critical 
um, certain parts of our employee base were to our survival last year um, is uh, a, a detail that was not lost on asset managers. I think the future of work um, and, and how critical employees are to the infrastructure of our economy is something that's not lost on asset managers. And I think it's something that you're going to see us as an industry respond to. Renee, final comment? Yeah, I think um, certainly everything that Leo um, and, and Thea um, mentioned, um, as well as Shay, um, if I could um, say just really uh, emphasis on um, regulatory framework um, in the private market space, I think we have to get that under control. Um, and then addressing issues around share buybacks as well, I think is something that we have to address as well. Dan. So I think the, the professor asked the question, what does success look like? And, and I want to channel Shay here too and recognize momentum. And I think success is closing this gap, you know, that, that EPI identifies between, sh you know, share of income going to the top 10%, blue line, union density, red line. Uh, and and you know, we should recognize what happened yesterday where we had a close to $2 trillion um, bazooka aimed at, at poverty reduction and lifting up the middle class, uh, securing retirement for, for hundreds of thousands of workers and I think success will beget success there. I, I live in the Midwest, I live in Cleveland. I think that that has already resonated in cities that need help and workers need help and, and uh, more to come as well. But I think it's, it's, it's really, um, you know, the, the investors in this call have a role in closing that, that, that gap that looks um, pretty correlated from the EPI graph. Deb, bring us home. On mute. Okay, David. Um, well, I love Leo's list and Thea's additions to it. But um, again, you're going to get see me go back to what I think we can get done. Uh, I think that we need to continue these partnerships. Um, I mean, I, for those on the call who don't know, I'm the one who started getting this Democratic Treasurers Association going. And I think the collaboration that we've been able to develop just in the last, it's only been, Renee, what, a year and a quarter? And even during the pandemic, which has slowed us down. So uh, I think politics and elections do matter a lot. And um, next year is going to be a little bit frightening because it, what we were able to accomplish yesterday, which was huge, just like Dan said, uh, we need more time to accomplish, particularly if you take Leo's and Thea's list, we need more time. Um, as the treasurer and um, the chair of the pension fund board, if you want to focus on down to um, investors, isolate that task. Um, we're working collaboratively with MIT, which David, I think you're aware of, to try to really nail down the E and if you want to call it EESG, and get a working definition and make it meaningful so it has a positive impact on the beneficiaries and the workers. Um, I, for one, have a strong, actually at this point, almost 100-year relationship on bringing unions in. My family brought the unions into our company. And to this day, I have those relationships with our unions that, and even though we family-wise went through a hostile takeover, the SEC, if you look historically, a strong SEC is good for unions and good for workers. And that's again, where politics matter. This is why I went into public service because I saw the destruction of positive and somebody said, can capitalists really be good? Yes, if you have a socialistic interpretation of what the role of capitalism is in this country. And that is it provides health insurance, jobs, uh, jobs that are secure with multi-generations of families working in those jobs, employers that believe their role is to create a middle class. I don't, when you talk about teachers and police officers being our middle class, they're not earning enough to be our middle class, but the role of the union gets us there. And so I'm, I'm sort of starting to sound like Leo, I'm talking philosophically, but in my day-to-day -day work and the 
and the coalitions I'm building, whether it's the Democratic Treasurer's Association, whether it's for the long term, which is our policy orientation, if it's what I'm doing, not just in on the pension fund, but internally changing the paradigm of who's being brought into those good paying. I have 800 employees under me. Who's getting the opportunities at those good paying jobs? Our, the treasury has good paying jobs and the treasury is now people of color and women. Show how to get it done and get it done. So that's kind of my reaction is I wanna stay on these, on these multiple paths that I've helped to create and create the coalitions that are going to have us get there. That sounds like a great place to end. I can't believe that was actually 93 minutes. Uh, it felt like two minutes to me. I could have uh, done this for another 90 minutes easily. I'm so grateful to this incredible collection of panelists. So dynamic and interesting. Uh, it was a great conversation. Thank you to all of you who Zoomed in for this. Uh, and participated in this. Thank you to our partners, the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism uh, and the Review of Banking and Financial Law. And thanks to all of you who joined us here today at BU Law. I really hope that we can do this again very soon.